Happy Sunday. So thank you to our praise team. And uh, Genial, his the family's here. They got to see him play the drums. <laughs> I'm sorry they couldn't be here last Sunday to hear your sermon. Very nice. Uh, yeah, so it's always a, a privilege and honor to be with you and to share, to be able to have the chance to share. Uh, good morning, Reverend Mrs. Dew. <laughs> um, Okay, so today's sermon is Chosen, Called, and Question Mark. So uh, this morning I, when I was praying about giving sermon this Sunday, uh, a couple things came to me. One was a voice of, of God. No. The voice of dew. <laughs> the uh, theme for this month is uh, what it means to be chosen. You know, part of the theme is we are chosen as a, the idea of a blessed family is chosen somehow, and so that's kind of one of the underlying themes of this month. So I was thinking about what does it mean to be chosen, and uh, so I'd like to share kind of three main points this morning, kind of three parts to this sermon. And uh, the first part, of course, has to be about Mother's Day, right? But please keep in mind what the question mark should be. I'd like to know what you think about that. But let's... There's a Jewish saying, God could not be everywhere, and so he created mothers. You ever hear that before? I think it's true. Okay. Uh, mothers are very special. And uh, this morning, I, I got up, well, last, last night, prepared a card for my wife. And so she was reading it this morning, and it said, wonderful. And she asked me, what does wonderful mean? So I thought, wonderful, let's see. Wonder, I wonder what this is, or I wonder who you are, or I wonder where I'm going. Wonder kind of means you don't understand. Or you don't know, right? And then wonder full, right? Full. So I realized wonderful means I'm full of not knowing who you are. <laughs> That's how wonderful you are. <laughs> it's not easy to figure out women. <laughs> Do you agree, men? So all men, turn, if your wife is here, turn to her and say, you are wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Means you're, you are full of things I don't quite understand. <laughs> I can't quite figure out everything. But I'm trying, okay? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, women are wonderful uh, in many ways, but especially when they become a, a mother. So that's a really important point. So in a recent speech, True Mother said, this is after she spoke in, in, in Vienna. She was meeting with members. She said, God is love, but mother is great love. That really struck me. It's like one of those, those quotes that kind of makes you stop and think, right? Yeah. Of course, we know that Within God, there's a mother, right? We all know that, right? God has a nature of both masculine and feminine. God has a heart of a father, but also God has a full capacity to love as a mother. That's why mothers could exist and be created. But the sad thing is that through most of human history, we were not introduced to God, who's our mother. So our idea about God, that God is love, had a certain kind of a box. It was in like a, a certain box. And it was, to be honest, somewhat limited. People's idea of God's love was according to their own particular concept. But we're living in a different age now. Okay? And that really is partly what my sermon is about, is we are not just any normal faith community. 
And we believe that the age of the New Testament, 2,000 years, has come, and now it's time for it to leave. And the age that is coming is the age in which we should actually build the kingdom of God in our lives, in this community, in our nation, and in the world. So really, Sunday service Sunday is about thinking about how can I better build God's kingdom now, right? So we're not waiting for some future thing to happen. We should not be waiting for some, you know, future cosmic event from heaven to happen, okay? That has happened already. The age of the New Testament has, has come, and after 2,000 years, it's time to say goodbye. And it's time for this world to really change and become the world where God can dwell. Amen? Amen. Are you? Okay, so Mother's saying, uh, this age of woman is the age when we should also discover God's love as a mother. That that's a, a great love, right? Okay. And then she said, I want to give you my love, my courage, and my wisdom. My love, that's very important. That's kind of like our grace. You know grace, everyone? God's love for you. And we hear that a lot, especially in the New Testament age, kind of singing in songs. We hear a lot about you know, surrendering to God and God's love and being embraced by God's, by God's grace. But then Mother also says, I want to also give you my courage, okay? That means guts to go out, right? And also my wisdom, the wisdom to know what needs to be done and how we can actually become God's true children and how we can actually make this world uh, God's world. So at this point, to conclude my Mother's Day aspect of this sermon, I want to show a short video. You may have seen this video before, but when I see it a second or third time, it always touches my heart. And it's about a job interview where they're interviewing people for the position of a mother, but they don't know it. The people don't know it, okay? So let's watch this video. Just give me one second. Thank sure. you. Sorry. Uh huh. Hey. Hi. Two minutes. Thank you. Hi. Good afternoon. Sorry about hey, that. Hey, Lori. Hi. Nice Hi. to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Have you ever done one of these interviews uh, over the camera before? No. Well, let me tell you a little bit about the job to get started with. It's not just um, a job, it's sort of probably the most important job. Uh, the title that we have going right now is Director of Operations, but it's really kind of so much more than that. Responsibilities and requirements are, are really quite extensive. Uh, first category for the requirements would be mobility. This job requires that you must be able to work standing up most or really all of the time, uh, constantly on your feet, constantly bending over, constantly exerting yourself, a high level of stamina. Uh, uh, okay. That's a lot. For how many, like, for how many hours? Uh, 135 hours to unlimited hours a week. It's basically 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I'm sure you'll have a chance from time to time to maybe just sit down here and there, yeah? Uh, you mean like a break? Yeah. Uh, no, there are no breaks available. Is, th is that even legal? Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. Okay, yeah. so like no lunch? You can or... have lunch, but only when the associate is done eating their lunch. Uh... <laughs> I think that's a little intense. No, no, no that's possible. crazy. Now this position requires excellent negotiation and interpersonal skill. We're really looking for someone that might have a degree in uh, medicine, in finance, and the culinary arts. You must be able to wear several hats. Associate needs constant attention. Sometimes they have to stay up with an associate throughout the night. Being able to work in a chaotic environment, if you, if you had a life, we'd ask you to sort of give that life up. No vacations. In fact, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, and holidays, the workload is gonna go up, and we demand that with, with a happy disposition. Uh, that's almost cruel. <laughs> that's almost a, a very, very sick, twisted joke. Worry about when there's time to sleep or... Oh, no time to sleep. Yeah, all-encompassing, all almost. That's exactly right. 365 days a year? Yes. No, that's, that's inhumane. That's, that's very insane. The meaningful connections that you make and the, the feeling that you get from really helping your associate are immeasurable. 
Also, let's cover the salary. The position is going to pay absolutely nothing. Excuse me? No. Nobody's doing that for free. Yeah, pro bono. <laughs> Completely for free. No. What if I told you there's someone that actually currently uh, holds this position right now? Billions of people, actually. Who? Moms. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Moms. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> oh! <laughs> and they meet every requirement, oh, don't wow. they? Oh, my God. Moms are the best. Yeah, there's no pay. They're 24 hours. They're always there. Now I'm thinking about my mom. Yeah, and what are you thinking about her? I'm thinking about all those nights and everything. Thank you so much for everything you do. I know it doesn't seem like I appreciate all of it, but I definitely do. So, Mom, I want to say thank you for everything that you've done. I love you very much. You've been there through thick and thin. My mom is just awesome. She's awesome. Okay, so I guess... All of us have some special memories with our mother. Uh, when I think of my mom, I may have shared this before, but she would get so upset at us. We were four boys, one girl, and she would sometimes just really lose it. And uh, she would go have this big spatula and she would whack us, you know? <laughs> and, uh, but the thing that I never forget is that no matter how upset she got, always, at the end of the day, she would come to my room and she would check on each of us, make sure we're okay, you know, that our hearts are okay. So please just take a f maybe 30 seconds and uh, just meditate for a moment and please think of one special moment with your mom and uh, for this Mother's Day. So let's just do that now. Just think of one special moment with your mom. Next part of this sermon, I want to talk about heavenly balance. I think this is really important. On the left is I am loved, especially by your mom, okay? Your mom always loves you, that's for sure. On the other side, it says only I can do it, right? Yeah, so I, next slide, I think. So on my computer, I have this little note that's always there. It says, hello, this is your heavenly parent. I know you. I'm with you. I believe in you. Most of all, I love you. But as much as this is true, I can't do it for you. So this kind of stimulates me day by day when I get a little bit tired. <laughs> so I want to talk about this balance, this important balance. On one hand, God loves us, and it's so important for us to know this love. And that's why, of course, mother's love is so important, because mother's love is so truly unconditional and so embracing, right? really embracing. And we can kind of say that this is God's 95%. In the divine principle, we teach that in the creation of a good world, the world of true love, that God fulfills 95%, meaning he does most of it. But there is still a small part, which is our job, and that is over here, only I can do it. No one else can do it. That's the 5%. Okay. So I want to emphasize this point because uh, we need to have this kind of thinking in order to build the kingdom of God. Okay. I don't think there's any mom that wants their kids to hang around and kind of dwell in their love all the time. 
sometimes I come across this situation where there's some guy, he's like 45 years old, and he's still living with his mom. He can't go out, can't find a wife, can't make a family. He's still there at home with his mom. Have you ever come across this situation before? Does it make you feel good, like this is a really healthy situation? A man, 45 years old, still kind of under his mother's apron, <laughs> kind of holding on there. No, that's not, that's not the heavenly way. That's not the way that God intended for us to be. So, although God loves us, we are the ones who need to do it. The divine principle makes it very clear that we have to actually, God, God's looking to us and God's saying, I want you to earn your position as a true son, as a true daughter. I want you to earn your position and to win victory in your life and become that Lord of creation that I know you can become. That's the kind of heart that Heavenly Parent has towards us. Okay? So here's a quote from Chung Sung Young, from our true father, Reverend Sun Young Moon. God should not create and do everything for us. God is to fulfill 95% and human beings should fulfill the other 5% as their responsibility. Only after we fulfill our portion can we stand on an equal plane with God, acting cooperatively with Him. Isn't that amazing? We believe the kingdom of God is a place where we stand on an equal plane with God. It's amazing, right? That God gave us that kind of gift, that kind of ability to stand on the equal plane with God. This is how the ideal of love is fulfilled. Without accomplishing our portion of responsibility, we cannot merit the honor of standing in an equal position with God and receiving his ideal love. So if we don't fulfill this responsibility, if we don't do our part, then actually true love cannot come into this world. True love will not be able to become substantialized in this world. And the New Testament age will keep going for another 2,000, 20,000, 200,000, <laughs> 2 million, thousand, whatever, okay? I know that's not what we want. God doesn't want... You know, this last 2,000 years, have they been all rosy and wonderful and, and good for humankind? It's been a pretty tough time, hasn't it? How many wonderful, beautiful Christians were martyred and put to death? And how many people have been sacrificed? How many good people were trodden upon in that course of history? So we don't want that kind of history to continue. So that's why it's so important for us in this community that we grasp on to this sense of responsibility, this sense that God is there with us, loving us, but he's looking to us to do it, okay? And I believe that's the heart of a mother, going back to the theme of a mother, right? The mother's heart. Can your mother go to school for you? When you were a young kid, could your mother go to school for you? No, right? When you're a young kid, maybe your mother could do your homework for you sometimes, which she's not supposed to do. <laughs> But when you go take the test, can your mom go in there and kind of slip in and take, take, take the test for you? No, right? Can your mother be there and make sure that you're able to make friends at school during the recess time when you're a little kid? No, right? Your mother's not there. If you want to get involved with sports, can your mother go out there and run, and run the race for you or, or tackle the person for you or, or make that basketball shot for you? <laughs> Can your mother do that? No, of course not. Can your mother go to college for you? Can she get uh, training? Can she get talents and, and skills for you? No, none of the above. Can she fall in love for you with another person? No. Can she sacrifice for you, for that person? No. How many things are there that your mother cannot do for you? It's endless. So the mother's heart is always loving us. That's on the left. And your mother created you and gave you life. But all the rest is what we need to do. And your mother is watching, and your mother's heart is hoping and so anxious to see you succeed. And even if you don't succeed, she still loves you and encourages you. 
And when you do succeed, her heart is just brimming with happiness. And she is so, so proud of you. And that's the heart of the Father as well. That's God's heart. It's just like a family. So yes, we want to receive God's love. We, we need to know how much God loves us. But most of what needs to be done, it is never going to happen until we do it. If that's our job, to do it. Okay? So I wanted to share this point. And the third point, then I want to get back to our topic. Uh, chosen, called, and what? Okay. This comes from the Bible. Instead of chosen, the term that is used is predestined. Romans 8.30. And those whom he predestined, or he chose, I'm going to put chose there, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So the word that I double underlined is the word justify. In other words, that's my doing it. When we do it, when we have that heart that you know, compels us to go and take responsibility for our lives, and to act upon the conscience that God gave to us. When we overcome all the doubts and all the hesitancy and all the things that you know, make us not want to go forward, and when we step forward and we go forward, at that moment, this is what justifies us. This is what allows God then later to glorify us. And God can say to the fallen archangel, look at my son, look at my daughter. See how great they are. See how different they are from you. Okay? They are my son, my daughter, in whom I am well pleased. Okay? So why are we chosen? Why do we get the blessing? This is a quote that uh, Janil gave us last week. Do you remember it? I was really inspired by this quote. It's such a great quote. Why do we get the blessing? in order to give the blessing to others and to the world. So when God chooses us, he chooses us because we resemble him. He's looking for people who resemble him. That's what God is looking for as he uh, chooses certain people and calls them. Right? And then for us to be able to live that way or have that same heart is what God is looking for. Who is this? Do you know? Yeah, right? From Greek mythology, Atlas. I always felt sorry for this guy. Right? He has a whole burden of the world on his shoulders. He's chosen to hold the burdens of the world, and he has nowhere to put it. So he has to hold it forever. Okay? So I really believe that was the kind of predecessor of this person. Right? So Jesus, when he bore the cross, he bore responsibility for all humanity for everyone's mistakes, for everyone's sins. His heart before God was, I will take everything. I will take responsibility for everything. Don't worry. Right? So that was God's heart. God's heart was, I want to find someone who has my heart and who is willing to give everything for the sake of others. And the blessing that God wanted to give to Jesus, the blessing of life, the blessing of love, to have children, all those things. He finally had to ask Jesus to give all that up in order to love humanity. Okay. So I believe when Reverend Moon was called at the age of 15, back in 1935 in Easter morning, that the burden that Jesus carried for 2,000 years, he was asking that young man, uh, God wants to choose you. He's saying to that young Reverend Moon, God has asked me to come to you. He's calling you. He, he's chosen you to take this burden, to, to love humanity, and to take responsibility for saving this world. Okay. And not only our true father, but also our true mother. Do you know how old she is? This is the engagement ceremony with True Father. She's 17 years old. And there's a quote from the autobiography of Father where he says that he told her at that time, this is not going to be a marriage like any other marriage. 
This is not a marriage where two people get together to be happy together. This is the marriage which is to save the world, to comfort God's heart. And then he warned her, especially the first seven years, are going to be very difficult. And you have to be willing to go through anything and everything. And she replied very simply and said, I'm ready, right? I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to do it. So at that time, at 17 years old, uh, she was called, right? And it's not easy to take that call. So in much of human history, people have grossly misunderstood what it means to be a chosen people. They thought, oh, I'm chosen. Uh, I'm going to go to heaven. <laughs> wow, how special I must be for God to choose me. The Holy Spirit came to me. Wow, how special I must be. I'm going to go to heaven. Don't you think that's what Abel was thinking when, he got, when God received Abel but rejected Cain? It's like he sees Cain being rejected. Whew, that's not me. Whoa, I got accepted by God. Huh. <laughs> Things are good. This is a, a huge misunderstanding of being chosen. And this is the tragedy of our ignorance and the ignorance of Abel. And it probably is what contributed to him being killed by his brother. Because he didn't understand that to be chosen is to share God's heart towards those who are less fortunate. Okay. And through much of Christian history, and True Mother mentions this in her talk with our members, again at the uh, celebration in Europe, she made it very clear. The Christian faith in many places misused their position when they colonized people. And they sometimes oppressed people. They had that wrong attitude that we are, we are the chosen ones and we're here somehow to you know, help you out or, or something. But it was not done with the right heart. And that's why in many parts of the world there still is some deep resentment towards the Christian faith even. Right? So chosen means to really carry God's heart and chosen means to give for the sake of others. When I was a young kid, we used to uh, play sports a lot. Basketball, baseball, football, all these things. We'd you know, do it in the, uh, in the yard or after hours school. And then always we get together, and then we get two captains, and then they would choose people. Right? One by one. You ever do that when you're a kid? Right? And you're, you're kind of sitting there, oh, are they, they going to choose me? And they skip you, and then th that guy chooses someone... And then that person chooses someone. And so how does it feel when you're chosen? Feels good, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, they, they chose me. That means they must you know, like me or they must think I'm pretty good. Okay. But how about the last kid? <laughs> Always there's the last kid, you know. Uh, I don't want him. You, you take him. <laughs> <laughs> So to be chosen, of course, it makes you feel special. It makes you feel, you know, something special. But also, the good lesson of sports is when you're chosen, you're expected to perform. The goal is for your team to win. Okay? Right. So to be chosen, okay? Really, it's about, uh, for our understanding, is to be able to share God's heart. 2,000 years ago, Jesus was trying to find people who he could call. He called 12 apostles, right? And he taught them the greatest love that anyone can have is to lay down their life for their friend. He tried to educate them and raise them up. But when it came time for him to be taken, was there anyone who stood up and who loved him? Was there anyone chosen by him then who followed that calling and they were justified because they we're willing to go all the way with Jesus? And the answer is no. Nobody was willing to really do it. You know, like, I got to do it. So they, they were called. They felt special. They sometimes argued about who would be at the right hand or left hand of the throne. But when it came down to actually doing it, not one person could step forward. Even Peter was given three opportunities. Are you with this guy, Jesus? And each time Peter said, not me. I don't know that guy. Forget it. Okay. 
And after the resurrection, that's what made early Christians so amazingly special to God's heart, is that they came afterwards, and they actually put their, they laid, they laid their lives down, right? It's, a, it's an incredible story of the early Christians who gave their lives by the tens, hundreds, thousands. Yeah. So God deeply loves the, all those amazing Christians, the Christian faith. Right? So today we are called... To receive the blessing of God is a calling. We're chosen by God. And God's there like a mother with a little kid looking to see what we will do. Can we actually do it? Can we actually live lives where we love others and we want to give the blessing to others? Right? That's most important. Anyway, the most beautiful woman in the world is definitely Lydia Compton. So why is she the most beautiful woman in the world? <laughs> Reverend Doom might get upset and say, wait a minute. I'm still waiting for you to jump out of your seat and, wait a minute, my wife is more beautiful. I think she's disappointed you didn't jump up. <laughs> okay. Okay. The reason why my wife is by far the most beautiful woman in the world it's because there is no other woman in the world who loves our four children the way my wife loves them. Okay? There's no other woman who will ever love those four children the way that my wife loves them. And for that, I cannot replace her for anything. Nothing. And also, I have to say, there's nobody who scolds me. <laughs> <laughs> Like my wife. <laughs> sometimes I say to her, do you have to always be the mother? Can't you sometimes play the other roles? <laughs> so that's why I believe true mother is very special. Okay? I believe that in God's heart, she is the most beautiful woman in the world. And the reason is very simple. Because she's the only one who loves all of God's children. I believe this with all my heart and soul. That for the first time, a woman stood before God and took responsibility in her heart and told God, don't worry, I will love everyone as my own children. And I will live my life that way, and I'll go through whatever I have to go through in order to fulfill that role. And she made that promise to God. So sometimes when we meet with True Mother these days, we expect just to get all this love. And sometimes I think we were shocked when sometimes she is quite strong and she says, hey, you got to go do it. <laughs> and sometimes members are like, oh, <laughs> I want more love. Okay. So she loves us. Don't worry. She loves us. But as a mother, she's looking at us and she's hoping and praying and believing that we can do it. And that's the most important thing. So to share this sermon with my wife, I want to invite her up to offer. Forgiveness for my sin And even beneath the waters That Christ was buried in I will rise, I will rise As Christ Baptized in blood and fire No fear and condemnation By faith I'm justified I will
manifest your Lordship and glorify your name. Your word is stands eternal. Your kingdom knows no end. Your praise goes on forever. 